Hello, I'm Matthew Trainer, Chief Executive of Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust. Welcome to Oxwide, our new webcast, coming to you every other Friday with a mixture of live chat and recorded interviews, telling you more about what's happening at the Trust and bringing you stories from the people who work for us and the people that we care for. I'm here today at Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidcup and behind me you can see the sculpture Men with Broken Faces by Ellie Grigsby which commemorates the men who came here for treatment for facial disfiguration during the First World War. This is now a thriving hospital with I think around a dozen providers on site, Guy's, King's, Oxley's, Darrant Valley offering a range of services and it's great to see the, the renaissance of Sidcup Hospital over the last couple of years. There's a couple of bits of trust news I want to update you on. The first is that we're now starting our winter preparation. It's been a tough year so far, but we're now starting to understand more about what the next phase might look like as we enter winter. So across the trust, we're looking at the pressure we're starting to see on our mental health services, on our physical health services, and how we support people with both recovering from COVID, but also the impact that COVID has had in a broader way. What it's done to people's employment, what it's done for their general physical health, being in lockdown for 100 days plus. And you'll hear more through the trust about what we need to do to get ready for the winter. Part of that is the flu jab. Um, this year we've all learned about the, the importance of good respiratory health um, and we will be rolling out the flu jab this year and nationally there'll be a huge focus on making sure that we all get it. It's vital that we protect ourselves but also that we're prepared to have the jab to protect those that we're around and those that we care for. So look out for announcements about our flu clinics. Two other pieces of news, one is staff risk assessments. These risk assessments, these individual risk assessments are a really important part of us making sure we can offer you the right protection and safeguards you need to do your job in a safe way. The deadline for completing the assessments is the 23rd of July, so go onto our internet, the OX, and find out about it, or look out for more information within your team about what you need to do to complete yours. Thank you to the four out of five staff who've already completed theirs. So we're almost there, but we just need the rest of us to make sure that we complete those risk assessments. And finally, staff recognition awards. There's a huge amount to recognise this year. People who have done tremendous things far above and beyond what's been asked of them in terms of the job to keep people safe and well during the pandemic. So do look around at the people you've worked with and look at the recognition awards. I mean, this year there should be an award for everyone um, because of the, the huge contribution we've made and to recognise that massive contribution the NHS has made. But there have been some real stars out there. So go onto the Ox, find out how you can nominate people and make sure that we get that opportunity to look at each other and say thank you for the fantastic work we've done. Now we're going to hear from our colleagues in informatics. This year, the Trust's digital infrastructure, the equipment and the kit that allows us to work remotely and the access to the information we need has been more important than ever. And we'd never have expected uh, virtual meetings to explode in the way that they have and, and the way in which we're using digital technology now to speak to each other, but also to deliver care to our patients. So here's Lisa speaking to some of those colleagues who behind the scenes have been working tremendously hard this year. So welcome to today's edition of Oxwide, where we're talking about COVID-19 and how this has been challenging all of us at Oxleys, and particularly information technology. Well, initially, Lee, I think um, the rollout of laptops across the organisation has been a massive task for IT. So can you tell us a bit about that and how you've managed to do that so quickly? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, so in IT, as soon as uh, COVID started, we um, we identified that there was a, um, a lack of IT equipment, mainly laptops out there within the trust for people to be able to work from home. And since March, we've actually uh, rolled out to staff over 700 laptops now, um, which has been a, a big ask on the on the um, on my teams and which have stayed late and worked um, over weekends and in the evenings to uh, to actually be able to do that and, and get that amount of uh, laptops out to to the trust. That's great, thank you. And what about those of your staff who haven't? been able to work remotely, who've not been doing that at all and have been carrying on business as usual in Bracken House? So yes, it was it was also identified that um, 
we would have to do a, a business as usual um, stint within our within Bracken House. So we have people that come to one collect those laptops, and they have iPads that come in. We take deliveries, and we also have um, people coming to collect their uh, smart cards. So we knew that we'd have to keep a certain amount of um, staff within Bracken House um, throughout this. And the way we've done this was by setting up early um, into skeleton staff. So we've done shift work, we rotated staff out. We made sure that we had plenty of sort of um, hand gels and, and sanitation in there that we can actually um, make sure it's as safe as possible for staff. We also had des designated um, rooms that we put people into so that there was that clear barrier between um, where staff normally go and where we had visitors coming into the building. And that has worked really well for us. And Sue, how have you, from an informatics point of view, how has your team responded to the challenges? So I think one of the biggest changes for us, uh, Lisa, has really been around the use of video calling. So the opportunity to have um, patient appointments by video, but also to connect with colleagues using video has been available in the trust for a number of years. But it's something that hasn't really um, been used by that many people until COVID. And then obviously we've, we've just had to stand up a huge amount of services. So we have um, the Attend Anywhere solution which is the patient facing solution, which is supported by NHS England. Um, and then we have the we've had the opportunity since the start of COVID to make a use of uh, MS Teams, which obviously Lee's team um, helped stand up. And then uh, Rena has been integral in actually making sure that we knew how to use Teams and the, and the best way of, um, of, of making that MS Teams a collaboration tool rather than just a messaging tool or a video tool. So there's a huge amount of resources that have been put on the OX. And I think that's one of the things that we wanted to recognise. Yeah, that's right. Obviously, um, MS Team is a collaboration app, as Sue mentioned. So, you know, within that app, you will be able to chat, have conversation, um, have meetings, and able to share files or screen uh, sharings. Um, so it's not only a one-to-one -one conversation, it's group conversation as well. Uh, and that's a good way as well to keep in touch with your team um, if everybody is working remotely uh, before you were able to be in the same office and, and have conversation. But this could be done as well using the MS team functionality. Um, so and and we are providing training um, and and everybody who required additional help or training uh, how to use the function uh, MS team will be able to book themselves using the Oxley's um, online um, centre. So it's roughly an hour, an hour and a half training session. And so is it right that you've also been able to um, enable patients to have contact with family and friends from on the wards? Yes, that's right, Lisa. So one of the things that um, became apparent very quickly was that for the safety of um, our patients and our staff and for visitors, we had to stop physical um, visits um, happening on the wards. So we there were a couple of things that we did um, from at this house. There was a, a desperate plea um, to support our patients there with LD to um, connect. So a number of colleagues ac across um, the informatics directorate gave up their own iPads and we've been able to repurpose those for staff on Atlas House. And then we worked with IT to set up a specific profile where we had devices on each of the wards that are um, designed just for video calling. So that's enabled us to ensure that patients have still had that opportunity to connect with their family and their loved ones. And then we've been really lucky in the trust to have some donations of devices as well. And Karen, thanks for waiting patiently there. I know that you're part of the team who are responsible for reporting data around the pandemic. So this must be a mammoth, an absolutely mammoth task. Um, but I know that you're reporting data out to NHS England, for example, as well as to managers within the trust so that we've all got an overview of roughly where we are with this situation. So can you tell us a little bit about the challenges you've faced around? Yeah, so um, quite early on in the pandemic, NHS England uh, started requesting additional information around what COVID, the impact it was having on our inpatient wards. 
So we're providing daily, daily uh, situation reports that will tell them how many patients we have who've been swabbed, how many are waiting to be swabbed, how many patients we have currently in the wards who've tested positive, and also what impact is it having on our staffing? So, for example, how many people have we currently off because they're positive or they're shielding or for whatever reason? So, yeah, we're having to make those returns every day, which is a huge challenge for the team, because when I say every day, that includes weekends. So my staff have been working throughout seven days a week uh, to the point it's sort of become a family joke at home because my husband refuses to go anywhere until he's asked the question at the weekend. <laughs> have you done your COVID submission yet? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's become a family affair, shall we say. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so some of the things that we're trying to do to ease the burden of that is to work closely with Rena's team. So at the moment, um, ward managers are submitting daily returns to us via an Excel spreadsheet. But we're trying to work with Rena to get Rio changed so that if they record the information on Rio, then we can extract it straight from there. And it just eases the burden a bit on wards. Okay. Lovely. Thanks very much. And just to remind everybody, all of this information is available on the Ox. And thank you to everybody today for your time and your interesting conversation. And this has been Lisa Tan for Oxwide. Thanks to Lisa and the informatics team there for an interesting film. I'm here now on Holbrook Ward at Queen Mary's Sidcup and I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Stacey. Nick, tell us what you do here at Oxley's. Um, I'm Oxley's Resuscitation Officer. I've been in the Trust since December. And why, why did we bring you in then, Nick? Uh, well, you brought me in because you needed some help with regards to your res resuscitation processes and policies um, and also the training. And we're going to see some of that training here today, including you're going to spend a bit of time talking me through, basically. I am. Support. Put you through your paces. Thank you. <laughs> so, ha, ha. Good. So you've got some help. And what are you going to do? Going to help. Yeah. Get yes. the bag. Oh, you got to think about. Okay. How are you going to assess this patient while she's opening the bag? So before we start chest compressions in this COVID time, what do we have to do? Right. So we have to we have to do AGP PPE, don't we? Okay. So we'll assume that you've got donned your PPE. So now you need to start your chest compressions. That's it. That's it. You carry on with what you're doing because you've got the bit of kit you need there. Removal clothing from chest and stomach. So you might have to just stop very briefly. Rip, take the clothes off. That's it. And now carry on with your take care. Take out pads from the bottom of the device. Good. Okay. Tear open the pads packaging. Yeah. Shock advised. Okay, shock advice. Stand clear. Press the flashing Make sure button. Make everyone is clear. Now. Make sure the shock is clear. Now. Okay. Deliver the shock. I'm delivering the shock now. Press shock delivered. Press. The back onto the face. Reanalyzing heart rhythm in two minutes. So squeeze the bag again twice. Get, mm. get some oxygen in so you can pump it round. Brilliant. Nice airway management. Very good. Good chest movement, stay there, don't move. How many so you approach the patient and you check for a response, okay? This patient might have fainted. You can't just assume they're in cardiac arrest, they may have fainted. So if you shout at them and shake them and stimulate a bit of a pain response up here on the trapezius muscle, if they don't respond to that, then they are you on AFPU, aren't they? So they are unresponsive. And that's the moment when you're going to definitely be shouting for help. So you've, now you know you've got an unresponsive patient in front of you. Okay. This is dead people oxygen. This is live people live oxygen. Life. Never the twain should be mixed no. together or, or confused. Yes. Okay? Dead people oxygen. Dead. Live. Live people. Brilliant. So this is just getting a huge amount of oxygen as much as you possibly can into exactly. the body in a short exactly. space. Exactly. We're throwing yeah. everything we can possibly we're throw in. Alive, Precisely. Right? Yeah. So when we're throwing oxygen in and our, our helper is doing chest compressions, we're putting the oxygen in and they're pumping it to the brain. So we're sucking the oxygen in yeah. and pumping it around. Exactly. Yeah. 
So we're going to do, you're going to talk me through basic life support. I am. Tell me what's happening. Okay, Matthew, so this patient, you've just walked in and seen this patient laying on the floor. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you need to do before you approach the patient is assess the area for danger. Mm -hmm. And that's danger to you. Okay. And what am I looking for? So you're looking for anything that's going to cause a slip, mm -hmm. a trip or a fall. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age of COVID, you need to be aware that chest compressions are aerosol generating procedures. But you can assess the patient and do the first bits that you need to do without AGP PPE. Okay. Okay. And I've had a look at the area then. So if I'm confident that the, the patient's in a safe space, there's no mm -hmm. slip or fall risk. So now you can approach the patient okay. and try and get a response from them. And how would I do that? So shake and shout. Okay. And squeeze their trapezius muscle, which is across which is, their shoulder, so nice and hard. It. Yeah. 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 So if there's no response, yeah. this is when you're going to be screaming for help. Yeah. Because you've got an unresponsive person in front of you. Right. Sir. So we'll shout for help and hopefully you'll hear lots of footsteps coming down the corridor. Mm -hmm. So you know help is coming. Now you need to assess if this person is in cardiac arrest. And how would I know that? So you first of all is airway. Mm -hmm. So look in their airway and see if there's any kind of obstruction in there. Mm -hmm. Most commonly vomit you would find in an adult. Right. So if there is, you turn their head to one side, right. turn them on their side, if you right. can, just to drain it out. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got that um, airway as clear as you can get it under these circumstances, no putting fingers in mouths. Yeah. So if there's anything more solid in there, it's gonna to have to just wait for a minute, okay, until okay. the kit arrives. Mm -hmm. The next thing you need to do is open the patient's airway. Mm -hmm. So we do a head tilt, chin lift. So put your hand on their forehead mm -hmm. and push down and then lift the chin. So push the head right back. Yeah. So in an adult, that's the position for an open airway. Okay. So hopefully with the patient's airway now opened, we're hoping they're going to start to breathe. Right. But we need to now see if they are breathing. So whilst you're holding the head in that position, mm -hmm. put your face against their face so that you're going to listen and feel and look down their chest to see, if to see if the chest is moving. So you look, listening and feeling yeah. for up to 10 seconds. And you're also looking for any signs of life. So can you see any fingers moving, mm. any f the feet are moving, any sign that they might have a pulse. If after 10 seconds you've seen no normal breathing and there's no signs of life, then you need to start chest compressions. They're um, in cardiac arrest. Last time I did this was in the Cubs in the 70s or 80s. Oh, okay. We used to do mouth to mouth, but that so isn't no really... mouth to mouth, yeah. no. And even in the community, we don't advocate it. The thing that has been researched to show good survival rates is good quality chest compressions, mm. not mouth to mouth. So how do I get on with that? Then? So you would don your PPE, yeah. obviously your AGP PPE. Then you need to put your hands in the centre of the chest. So put one hand into the armpit and drag it across. Mm -hmm. So come across into yeah. the armpit and then across to the middle. That's yeah. the centre of the chest. So yeah. that's your landmark, OK? OK, got you. Put right. the other hand Understood. on top. Yeah. And you're doing this with the heel of your hands. So interlock your fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're going to push a third of the depth of the chest. Yeah. So in an adult, that's quite a long way. Yeah. Each time you push, you must allow the recoil of the chest. Yeah. Okay. And you're going to go at 100 to 120 beats per minute. And we're saying staying alive. You by can the sing staying alive. Another yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites right. the dust. So, so anything that's going to keep you in that rhythm. That's all right. So that's faster that's than it. I expected, isn't Bit it? Bit harder. That's it. Keep contact on the patient's chest. Don't yeah. let your hands jump around. That's perfect. And how long would you do that for, Nick? So you do, you're just going to do continuous chest compressions until help arrives. And once help arrives, they yeah. will have the resus bag. Right. And they're going to get the bag valve mask out. And okay. once they've got that attached to oxygen and they're ready, mm -hmm. then you'll do 30 to 2 breaths. 30 to 2 breaths. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the ambulance will be there soon. And how, how long are, would you, you know, in your experience, are people continuing the chest compressions for? Can you you can't do it for any longer than two minutes right, in okay. reality because it is a, it is really tiring. It's quite hard work. Isn't yeah, it? if you're a lot doing of it, it, yeah. It? These mannequins are designed to give the same kind of resistance that you would get from a person of that size. Yeah. So obviously, the bigger the person, the more resistance you're going to have to push even harder. Right. So you check for breath. Yep. Check the check the airway first. Yep. Check for breathing. Yep. Any and movement. If there's no signs, any yep. movement. If there's no signs, hand on the armpit across the middle and start the compressions and wait for help to arrive. Perfect. Okay. And a lot of people get worried that they think, oh well, what if they're not in cardiac arrest and I've missed a sign that they're alive? 
the fact of the matter is if you start doing chest compressions on them and they're alive, gonna they're going to let you know because okay. <laughs> that's really, really painful. So if they don't move and they don't stop you doing it, then they're definitely in cardiac arrest and you need to carry on. And thanks for that, Nick. Things have changed. Uh, not a great deal, but they've changed in the 40 or so years since I last tried that out in the Cubs. I'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and so earlier this week, I caught up with the PPE team at Pinewood. We've heard here that it's critical you have the right PPE when you're involved in these kinds of circumstances, but it's been so important to us all this year. So let's find out what the PPE team have been doing to support us. Hello, I'm here at Pinewood House in the PPE hub, which has been running since March to support colleagues across the trust with their PPE needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm here with, with Rashpal, with Rod and with Sam who've been running the hub and we're going to have a chat about what they've been through in the last uh, couple of three months here. So we'll start with you Rashpal. So tell me about the process of getting this set up, what was that like? Um, we started this um, initially as soon as we set up the incident control centre at Pinewood. Um, we centralised all PPE because we realised there was going to be issues in procuring it, working with Procurement Charmaine and obviously with infection control, we wanted to make sure that all staff had sufficient PPE that they required and initially we manned it ourselves but then we went out and canvassed for some more volunteers which um, Rod kindly answered and Sam so they came into the team as well and since then we've just been growing the hub as it's sort of um, progressed in terms of COVID-19. So initially it was collections, good to see staff when they came in, talk to them, reassure them, and then it's progressed to a delivery service, and now we've sort of tweaked it a little bit for set days because of the increase in um, traffic just generally. And how did you find that at the start then? Because I mean, we're, we're quite a long way through this now, but there was a couple of weeks there where it really was quite frightening. It, yeah, it, it totally, totally frightening, and I, th I think it was a, a really good call to centralise PPE. One, it um, had we had control over it, and secondly, it was to meet staff. I think it was really important to reassure staff that we did have PPE, and it went against a lot of the government stuff you were sort of hearing in the news, etc. Um, but staff could see we had PPE and sufficient supplies, so uh, reassurance, I think, more than anything. Thing. And people were reading that we're, that nationally we were running low in stocks. Yeah. Did we ever run out here at Oxley's? We came close a couple of times to having very little, but again, with procurement, we went through it. And I suppose it's given people that confidence that they can run their stocks quite low, but you've always come through, you've always delivered. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think the sort of message, as it was then, as it still is, is to make sure you just order what you need and not sort of, sort of stockpile or accumulate, because we do have stock coming in all the time. Mm -hmm. So people need to be just a bit. Right, and turning to you, Rod, I mean, you answered the call for yeah. help here. Tell me what you were doing before you um, came to the PPE. I work for Children's Therapies, uh, who are based at Goldie Lee. And my role is working with complex children in mainstream schools. And obviously those children were, are quite vulnerable. So a lot of those children I would see were withdrawn from school even before the schools were in, in order to protect them and then when the schools closed obviously our roles in children's therapy changed because we couldn't see a lot of our children face to face which is what I was doing um, so the therapists did a, a few, quite a few of their uh, appointments via video link but my role is very much hands-on yeah. face to face so that I, I wasn't able to fulfill that role so when this opportunity came along, I thought it's my opportunity to do something that's practical and actually going to help the whole trust. And what's the experience been like, Rod? Oh, it's been really good. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. Mm. It's been really busy, um, pressured at times, but I think that's been part of the enjoyment in a way. It's been great to meet and work with new people and to see new systems being set up um, and to experience that and also to meet people from different areas of the trust. I mean, before I came here, my knowledge of the trust was quite limited, even though I've been working for this trust and Greenwich Community Health Service for you know, 16, 17 mm. years. Um, I didn't realise the breadth of the services. So to meet people from prisons, mm. from the ward, different wards, and from the different community services has been mm. an eye-opener and really enjoyable. And there's been such a range of experiences. I mean, you mentioned prisons, we've got inpatient yeah. settings, community teams, they're all dealing with their own different sets of challenges yes. and, and PPE just adds complication to that. So, you know, what, what are the kinds of conversations you've had to have with people when they've come in? Um, 
Well, reassurance around the fact that we do have stocks mm. and that they don't need to stockpile. Mm. Um, just asking them how they feel and what's going on, I, th I think, has been beneficial mm. because they've always, people have wanted to feed back how they're feeling. And I think having that two-way conversation has been reassuring for all the, all the parties, really. Are you looking forward to getting back to your, your day job at some point? Uh, I am, yes. Yeah. I'm not sure when that's going to start because a lot of my work was done in schools. Mm. So they potentially are going back in September. Mm. But whether that will be all the children that I regularly see, we can only wait and find out. So you may be here for a while yet. Um, well, it doesn't seem to be calming down here. That's yeah. the other thing. It's Although we've gone through different phases mm. of how we've run the, the process, as Rashpal's explained, I think it's, it's, each one has brought its own new challenges. Mm. And I think the need for PPE seems to be still at the same level. To yeah. Well, and, and with the new guidance on masks yeah. everywhere as well, we're just all going to have to get used to this as a way of life. I mean, thanks so much to, to Sam, to Rod and to Rashpal for this. And I suppose the one thing I've heard loud and clear from you all is that we don't really want to see many more chocolate bears. <laughs> they were enjoyed though. They were widely enjoyed, the fudge was good, but they, they know this has been such an important part of this. The key thing in, in this kind of circumstance is for people to feel confident they've got the right kit. And thanks to the work that's gone on in this room and right across the Trust, I think on the whole we've been able to make sure that people have had what they needed. It's come close to the wire at times, but thanks very much to Rashpal, to Rod, to Sam and to all our colleagues across Oxleys for the help with this. Thank you. Great to hear from the PPE team there and the fantastic work they've been doing across the Trust. Thank you for joining us for this first edition of Oxwide. If you've got any questions or comments on what you've seen, then contact us using the details on screen now. And if you'd like us to come to visit your team and find out about the work you're doing, then do let us know. We'd be very keen to come and speak to you. Thank you and see you next time.